Okay, it's 10.30, so I would like to reconvene with the presentations if everybody's ready for that. Uh, as promised, I would just repeat that the presentation together with the recording of the complete set of presentations will be shared with you later today. So let us continue now with uh, the presentation of Thierry, who is uh, at this moment sharing a screen, I see, and uh, continue with the elaboration of harmonized standards. Please, Thierry, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning. So this presentation will be more on documentation. It will be uh, making the link with the two previous uh, presentations that will be more focused on documentation. So you, you are probably aware that there are a lot of uh, non-compliant assessment and many of those non-compliant assessment are um, caused by often, often the majority are caused by issues related to the documents, to incorrect uh, normative reference, undated or outdated normative reference. There are a lot of non-compliant assessment created by uh, incorrect annex ZAZZ, and we will come later on that. And of course, there are, can be other reasons like <clears throat> the standard out of scope of the uh, with the standardization request or repeating uh, elements of EU legislation terminology. So obviously, and this will not be the purpose of this uh, presentation, the internal rules part three related to editorial elements need to be taken into account by any working group and TC secretary developing standard. This is just a reminder that there is a, an annex in the, in the rules which give you a kind of checklist of all the elements to be checked in order to have your standard um, acceptable and properly uh, fit for uh, edition and submission to a process like inquiry and or formal vote. But in this presentation, I will focus on very specific elements which are connected to harmonized standard aspects. But first of all, I'm linking to the presentation of Catherine mentioning the standardization request. It is very important to have the the, the standards uh, properly connected uh, when the work item is created, properly connected to the legal requirements. So when you create a, a new work item, you need to pay particular attention also on the elements 18, 19, and 20 of the new work item sheet, because this is extremely important because we are using in CCMC this uh, piece of information to uh, encode uh, the elements in the database. And if the standard is not connected to a directive or a mandate, it will not be submitted to ENSEN. Also, you need to be sure that in the standardization request, the work item has been foreseen. Otherwise, you will not be able to get an assessment from NCEN. This is an example, it's a, a fictive example of a, a document which suddenly uh, is created and is supposed to support two uh, directives, machine and low voltage directive. But uh, it appears that uh, the secretary realized that in fact, it was not foreseen, for example, in the LGD to um, to revise the, the document and therefore it is not listed as a standard to be supported by the LVD mandate. So it is important that the, 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 the secretary of the TC inform CCMC either through the new work item sheet, but certainly it would be interesting to get a, a personal email exchange or phone contact with the program manager in charge because as explained uh, earlier, 
um, we will need to ask uh, and to include this work item into the, the, the amendment to the transition request. The Catherine mentioned that the Commission could do an amendment of transition request on a yearly basis, if necessary. So it is the opportunity to, to do this through uh, this process. So this, is, this slide is just summarizing what I just mentioned before. Uh, remember that the draft standard can only be assessed if it is recorded properly in the system connected to a directive and a mandate. And if a standard is not in the transition request, obviously it will not be able for the desk officer to propose referring it into the official journal. And so you will lose harmonization. The first element in a, in a document is of course the forward. I think uh, the document is, the template is quite straightforward. Just wish to point out about a, a few elements of the forward. Um, it is important in particularly for harmonized standards to mention the clause, clause comparing the current edition of the standard with the previous version. It is important, particularly for, for the, the desk officer and the, the consultant, to know what has been changed, to be sure that the key elements uh, which were in the previous version for supporting the directive and essential requirement are still there and have not been removed or uh, reviewed quite dramatically, leading to a um, uh, an uncompliant assessment. Of course, the, the, the forward indicate as well that the, the standard is an harmonized standard and will support European directive or regulations. Um, but it is not the purpose to list in the forward the mandate and the regulation of directive. This will be done in the annex ZA or ZZ that we will <clears throat> discuss later. The scope is, of course, an important element of the standard, particularly in the, the case of an harmonized standard. Remember that the scope needs to be concise and clear and only mention statements of fact. The, there are some elements contained in internal regulation which need, of course, to be uh, applied. The scope is neutral, is describing as precisely and as concisely as possible what is the purpose of the standard. It should not contain any uh, requirements. <coughs> so the key element which is causing uh, non-compliant assessment is often the, the normative reference clauses. There are, um, of course, in the internal rules, clause 10 to be followed, but I will give a kind of digest here of the key elements which need to be particularly taken into account. So first, we need to take into account normative reference in the general context for any standard. What is the normative reference clause? It is normally close to, it is mandatory, and it lists the normative reference used in the standard for the convenience of the standard user. And it lists, of course, it explains how they should be applied, described in the text, will not be done in this clause, it will be inside the, 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 the text. The clause is simply telling, this is the documentation that you will need to apply the standard. This clause is informative and because it does not contain any requirements. And so the, the information of all the standards will be applied, will be found inside uh, the text. The clause is always starting with the, the, the following uh, standard sentence, which summarizes what is uh, the possible status of each of the normative reference listed in the normative reference clause. Remember that informative reference 
should not be listed in the normative reference clause. It is quite uh, an evidence. And this one shall be listed in the bibliography. So in the generic context, I'm, no, I'm still not speaking of the particular case of harmonized standard. There are three elements to uh, get, to, to have the possibility to have undated reference. The three elements are written on the slide. It needs to refer to a complete document. It would be possible to use the future, all the future change of the reference document for the purpose of the referring document. The latest edition of the reference document, including all the amendments, need to be applied. And also, it is understood that the reference will include all amendments to and revision of the reference document. The case of dated reference, again, in the generic uh, approach of voluntary standard, not specifically harmonized standard. The dated reference are reference to a specific edition indicated by the date of publication. And it can also be, when the document is in the under development, a reference to a specific uh, inquiry version of a draft standard. So in the case of data reference, obviously, only the data reference apply and not the next version. So it is very important for the TC to, despite the standard is published, to monitor that there are no evolution in the standard, which are in the normative reference clause. Because if some standard with the normative reference clause change, it is maybe necessary to amend the standard uh, you are developing, you are responsible for, in order to update the normative reference. No, this is a simple example, which show you that in this case, uh, we are using methods specified in ISO 128-20, for example. It is the generic standard, the whole standard is applicable, while in the case here, this specifically a table of a version of a standard. So it is normal that you need to specify which table of which edition uh, need to be applied. Now, of course, and this is the purpose of the, the meeting in the European, with the European Commission harmonized standard context, there are additional European Commission uh, requests. But they are very, very uh, similar to, uh, to, the, to the internal rule part. So for the commission, it is, this element of normative reference is, is important for legal certainty. So there are three principles. The normative reference are integral part of the standard. Standards are part of a legal system because the standard become harmonized standard and support a legal system. And also those standards, by the fact that they become harmonized, give presumption of conformity to a legal act. So there is a legal effect. And there is also advantage for the, for the, the, the manufacturer that Applying an harmonized standard means that they, they have the presumption of conformity to the essential requirement of the directive. So they do not need to prove that when they follow the, the standard, they, they, they are applying correctly the directive. So as I said already, the requirement from EC are very aligned with the internal regulation part three. Uh, but as they are harmonized standards, and the, the Commission is um, referring to those in the official journal, uh, allowing, let's say, the possibility to get presumption of conformity. There is a need to have a stable, clear um, set of normative reference. So, for the Commission, there is a need, basically, systematically, to date the normative reference. The documents must be, of course, publicly available. And the TCs should uh, actively 
assess and validate all the references which are in the document. Of course, uh, more you have um, normative reference, and in some documents, some standards, there are very long lists of normative reference, it will be extremely difficult for the TCs to, to monitor all this, because for sure, nearly every month, there will be modification of the data reference. So does not mean also that all the reference need to be dated, because if there is no real link uh, of some of the clause with essential requirements, they are not really part of the harmonized element of the standard. So there is a possibility to not date the normative reference. There are also other cases where, and if due, uh, a justification is duly uh, submitted to the commission prior uh, assessment, that we, the commission could accept there is not a need to um, date this normative reference. But in general, the dating is, uh, is the, the suggested way forward by the commission. So in the generic uh, parallel context, because I saw already a few questions related to IEC uh, developed standards, there are many IEC developed standards for LVD and EMC. And so obviously for IEC and ISO, the policy is slightly different. The, the normative reference are usually not dated. And so when a Senelec or a Sen transpose IEC or ISO document, there is a need to find a way to date in the normative reference of the IEC or ISO standard, the, the, the standard. But if IEC does not want to refer to dated reference, there is a kind of tool, which is the Annex uh, ZA. Uh, ZA is not uh, Annex ZA of a same standard, which is an unharmonized Annex ZA to link the essential requirements with, uh, with the, the clause of the standard. This is an Annex ZA, which is, of course, an European element and which clarify for the European context, for the sake of respecting the EU legislation, which date is, uh, is, has to be used in the context of the EN. So the Annex ZA is specifically uh, is normative in the, in the Senec IEC context. There is a, a clear template that you can find easily on the, on the boss. And in fact, it replaces the reference in the body of the text. And it will be as it is an annex at the end of the document. But there is a kind of, uh, let's say, bemol to this uh, rule. If there is no dated, if the document is not dated in the IC version, the document should not be dated in the ENIC version as it is a pure adoption with no modification. For ISO, there is not so, such a case of today, there is not such a, an exit A existing. There are discussion to see which kind of modalities could be offered to the, the sentences who need to get a clarification on the data reference. But usually, again, the the approach is to get ISO uh, dating in the normative reference clause of the ISO document, the normative reference clause. The so requirements are indeed the same for IEC and for um, ISO standard, which will, which are aiming to become harmonized. Of course, there are some, let's say, interpretations which sometimes diverge a little bit of this approach I explained here below, here before. Uh, consultants have the tendency to request to date the complete series of standards. They even request to refer the annex ZA to normatively reference standard with a dated reference. As I said, I do not accept this exception, as I explained before. And also, of course, this is quite logic that each time 
there is a need to amend the annex ZZ, um, they would like that uh, the, the TC amend as well the annex Z uh, in order to cover the, the main standard and, and the amended element. In summary, to uh, summarize the, this important chapter, which is quite difficult to manage for many TCs, in the, in the context of harmonized standard, it is possible to get dated or undated reference in harmonized standard. Whenever the TC consider the use of non-dated or dated, a check with, with the SIS consultant needs to be done and need to be done beforehand, not when the document is submitted to inquiry or formal vote, because then there is a risk to get a, a, an uncompliant assessment. It happens also in some standards that there is a need for LVD or machinery to get a, a risk assessment. Uh, there is also a possible need of uh, carrying a risk assessment of, for the justification of the dated uh, normative reference. Uh, for example, if you are using, uh, I don't know, do you need to, to make a dated reference to a standard on bolts, on nuts, etc.? This is a classical uh, uh, component. So possibly uh, there is not so, such a big risk that there is so, such an evolution uh, in the, in the document, which would create a, a problem in terms of harmonization of legal certainty, etc. So, if there is a possibility, of course, if, that if uh, um, there is an undated reference, the EC may consider to correct this, uh, let's say, mistake in the in the OGE publication by a notice that it is not a, a favorite option. And so Sen and Senec are strengthening the support to TC, as it is the case now, to comply with the drafting rules and the EC requirements in terms of normative reference. Reply, remember also that our chapter 10 of internal regulation three are still uh, essential to apply. Um, and uh, obviously, maintain the communication as far as possible with the HRS consul. Now, briefly, a couple of uh, considerations con con connected to a series of other requirements which can create a non-compliant assessment. The terminology used in the standard needs to be in line with, of course, with the legislation. Do not create a de definition or even use an IEC uh, definition, which is in contradiction with the a definition contained in the directive. So in general, you cannot uh, contradict relevant EU legislation, and you can also not repeat, copy the requirements of the legislation in a normative part of a document. If there is a need, any need to refer to a, a piece of legislation, this need to be done through an informative footnote. There are some standards which need uh, safety uh, risk assessment, hazard list, as I mentioned before. So please carry this task if you need to do this in your specific case. And also a topic where there are often uh, rejection by non-conformity assessment is the non-respect of the non-neutrality principle. What is the neutrality principle? In a nutshell, it is summarized on the slide. It is, you cannot refer in a product standard to conformity assessment elements. You cannot say that the standard will be uh, check by um, a notified body or the, the manufacturer will need to carry this test with this condition and this condition. There is a need to make the test and the requirements neutral and who will carry the task has to be done outside 
the content of the standard. And quite often, this can lead to non-citation the official journal. No, the most important and most uh, well, workload uh, demanding element of the standard is the development of the Annex ZP. Here I took uh, an example of a machinery directive standard. I took also an example of a, a table which is quite generic, is a tricolon table for sure if you are developing standard for CPR, so please contact Nuno uh, for further question. Here I will only, as explained by Cynthia, explain generic elements. So as I mentioned already, when I was speaking about the forward, the, the annex uh, ZAZZ will contain always a kind of introduction where the directive will be listed and the mandate will also be List. The, 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 the annex Z is usually in three columns. The first column is always the requirements of the directive. And then the clause are the clause which has been identified to support the essential requirements of the directive. In the case of safety of machinery or LGD, there is need to do a, a risk assessment. So it helps already through this analysis to identify what are the requirements. Of course, there is a principle, and before I will finish my description, the third column is remark. Is a column which is, can help to clarify something and to, to explain a, a, a link between the two first column elements but usually it will remain blank. It is only, usually it is a consultant who will tell or ask to clarify something in, in this column. So what is important to, to mention is that there is a, a, a need to be, um, to, to have a, a good level of granularity. It is very generic concept because it can vary from, uh, directive to directive and from desk officer to desk officer. But obviously, there is a need to have a, a, a detail to, to the, 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 the clause of the standard. For example, here, I see that there is 5.2.1, 5.2.2.2, 5.2.3. Maybe if there is only three sub clause, uh, it could be summarized to 5.2. It depends from sector two sectors, this needs to be checked with the consultant and the directive and the desk officer. But usually there is a need to have a clear granularity. And why we need to have this level of granularity? It is, uh, I will explain it uh, in general term on this slide. So just remind you that for your specific sector on the Sen or Sendelec bus, you will find the relevant an exit A or ZZ template that you, you are invite, invited to use because we update those, those elements uh, when needed. But as I explained before, the granularity is an important uh, concept. Uh, you cannot obviously refer to a generic uh, clause because obviously then you will miss the point and you, you will not address specifically the essential requirements. So quite often, uh, the, the rejection is done is caused by the wrong match between the clause of the yen and the essential requirements. Either it's too broad, they are putting too many elements. There are some elements which are not really giving presumption of conformity. They are simply describing some, some elements. Or sometimes there is some lack. Uh, you, you miss the point and you forgot to mention a clause of the standard to, and to link it to essential requirements. So obviously, it is the main task of the consultant. So there will be very, uh, uh, let's say, they will, they will go in the very detail about this. There are, uh, as just mentioned before, elements sometimes which are not linked to essential requirements and those need to be, to be avoided. And it happens also that some, some TCs are linking 
uh, essential requirement with clause of a standard, which is not the standard for which the annex ZAZZ is developed. So those are the kind of big issues that we are meeting when developing an exit, uh, and, and this is creating, of course, non-compliant assessment. And to finalize, let's dream that we have fin finally succeeded to get um, compliant assessment, that the desk officer is ready to uh, publish the reference in the official journal. I would like to mention that, that today, the, the way the commission is referring to the harmonized standard is not as in the past, it changed about two years ago. Nowadays, the, the lists are not full list. As you see on this example, the list is, uh, is very limited. It is limited to the new, element, the new standard, which are um, in, inserted in the, the generic set of standards supporting the direct. There is still, however, uh, a good tool provided by the Commission. The Commission prepare uh, Excel. It's based on an Excel table anyway. There is a PDF and Excel version. So you can collect, if you are interested by a, a sector, machinery director, directive, list of standards, you can always go and find uh, this list here. But the Official journal will only come with a specific new standard or withdrawn standard, and they will not be in the C list, they will be in the L list, which means legal. Why it is in the legal? Because again, due to the, the need to have a, a very good scrutiny and validation by uh, le legislative authorities, the list is now submitted via an internal consultation. That's why it takes some time, a lot of time. And Gonzalo will, will explain later a bit more about this. That's why uh, the, the, the document is now published in the L list, because to, at the end of the day, the college of the commissioner of the European Commission will accept and sign the implementing act which will lead to this publication in the L list of the official journal. I will now uh, stop because it is, uh, I think, the Nuno who will present this, uh, this uh, last part, the last document, which is brand new. So please, Nuno, go ahead. Thank you, Thierry. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, yes, yeah, so now I would like to provide some. Um, some information about uh, the checklist for drafting uh, harmonized standards, uh, a recent initiative. But before that, to set uh, the scene, uh, in the last months, we have seen an increase in lack of compliance, hast assessment uh, results. And that's why our SEN Senelec uh, BT Working Group 12, that gives recommendations to the technical boards on horizontal aspects uh, related to harmonized standards supporting EU legislation, saw the need to put in place some, some measures to help the technical bodies to really increase the number of positive uh, HAST assessments. So following the recommendations of, of this uh, BT working group, 12, the technical boards approved the mandatory use of a checklist to help the technical bodies in drafting harmonized standards. So here on the slide, you can see as well uh, at the bottom, the two BT uh, decision references. So basically the checklist is not really to impose any additional requirements, is more of a reminder to the technical uh, bodies on aspects that must be checked when drafting harmonized standards in order to um, fulfill some, some requirements like commission requirements for citation in the official journal. And the aspects that Thierry just uh, presented on this session of the webinar are covered uh, in the checklist. On this slide, we can see the three main principles for the use or submission of the checklist for harmonized standards. So the first one is when drafting homegrown harmonized standards or harmonized standards under Vienna agreement, but with SEND lead or European common modifications in the case of Senelec, technical bodies shall check the compliance of these harmonized standards against a dedicated horizontal 
checklist. So this is the principle number one. The second one is that the TC secretary needs to ensure that the checklist is completed and submitted to CCMC together with the draft R9 standard, either for inquiry or formal vote. And the supporting documents to that checklist, if relevant, need to be provided as well. And uh, the third principle of the checklist is there is that during the inquiry and formal vote procedures, CCMC will reject as of 1st of October, the submission of a draft harmonized standards if the checklist was not submitted or if it was submitted, but it was not completed or if it was submitted, it is completed, but the some supporting documents uh, were not uh, provided. Then there are other important aspects about, uh, about the checklist. So one important aspect, obviously, is that the checklist covers horizontal aspects that must be taken into account by the technical bodies when drafting harmonized standards to be cited in the official journal. So this means that if you are developing a standard that is uh, covered by a standardization request and EU regulation or directive, but it's not intended to be cited in the official journal. So in this case, the checklist would not apply. The second point that is important is that the checklist is recommended until uh, the end of September, but then it will become mandatory. So we are now in a transition period to for the technical bodies to get used to the use of the checklist, but we strongly recommend that you already start using and submitting the checklist together with the RMI standard to CCMC. Another point is that uh, the checklist is horizontal and applies to all sectors except the construction sector. The construction sector is really specific. It's not really follow, following the, the new legislative uh, framework. So there was a need to prepare uh, a modified checklist based on, of course, the horizontal check, checklist for the, development, for the development of harmonized standards in support of the construction products regulation. So the checklist is under preparation, and uh, I believe it will be finalized rather soon. And then, of course, all the technical bodies will be informed when this particular checklist will be available for construction. Um, the checklist shall be filled out before dispatching the draft standard for three different stages. The first working draft stage, the inquiry and formal vote stages. In case the TC receives a lack of compliance at formal vote stage, of course, the TC will have to uh, take a look at the comments from the consultant, eventually revise the standard to address the comments from the consultant. And then when the TC is going to resubmit the standard to CCMC for formal vote, the checklist should be submitted together with this revised uh, draft for formal vote. In terms of parallel work, it is strongly recommended the, the use of a checklist for drafting harmonized standards under the Vienna Agreement and Frankfurt Agreement with ISO or IEC lead. My colleague in the next session will give you further information for the parallel work, but what is key is that you coordinate with the ISO or ICTCs at international level to ensure that certain elements covered in the checklist are tackled in, um, in the draft uh, standard being developed at international level. On this slide, you can see the checklist. That is a print screen of, of the checklist on the right side. It has been sent to all the technical body secretaries and chairs. Um, in the email, we also included some instructions on the use of checklist. Uh, this, we are also preparing a sentence and a like boss page to give some guidance on the drafting of RMI standards and such um, page are under finalization today. And once they are uh, concluded, of course, all the technical bodies uh, will be informed. Uh, the checklist basically includes a number of questions that are divided per different uh, or according to different categories. And each of the questions needs to be checked. And if everything is checked, it means that the draft standard at the end uh, is good to be submitted to CCMC. On this slide, uh, and I'm slowly uh, reaching the end of this, uh, this uh, session of the webinar before I pass to the next one, just to explain that on this slide, we have the inquiry and formal vote process in SAN for the use and submission of the checklist for RMI standards. One of the important elements is that, and this is referred here at the bottom of the slide, is that in SAN, 
the matrix of responsibilities must be followed. So that is a send BT decision about the matrix of responsibilities. It's a BT decision that clearly explains who is responsible for doing what within the TC when developing the ARM9 standard. On the left side of the screen, you have the working group tasks. So the working group obviously uh, is responsible for drafting the ARM9 standard under the leadership of the convener. The working group qualified support needs to check that the draft ARM9 standard fulfills the requirements of the standardization request and um, or the mandate and the EU regulation or directive in order to be cited in the official journal. The working group qualified support needs to ensure that the checklist is completed and either the working group qualified support or the convener or the convener needs to submit to the TC secretary the documents that are listed here below that I have already um, explained in, in the previous session. So the draft are nice standards, the checklists which must be completed together with some supporting justifications or documents and the inquiry has assessment report with the last column observations of the secretariat uh, completed to show how the TC is going to address the comments from the consultant, but this is only applicable for the formal vote stage, not for the inquiry stage. Once these documents are submitted to the TC secretary, now we are on the right side of the slide, the TC secretary needs to be sure that the checklist was uh, that the checklist is there and it was completed. If it was not completed, the TC secretary is responsible for sending back the arm standard and the checklist to the working group in order to complete the checklist and ensure that those aspects that were missing in the checklist are also tackled in the draft standard. Then the TC secretary obviously needs to submit uh, these two documents, so the arm standard and the checklist to CCMC. And if everything for formal vote or inquiry, if everything is fine, these processes can uh, start if the checklist is not um, submitted together with the draft standard. Basically, CCMC, as I just referred, will reject the ARM9 standard submission and the TC secretary is responsible then to ensure that the checklist is completed. Probably could be that uh, the TC secretary may need to send back to the working group uh, in order to solve this. Now on the slide, and it's the last slide, we have the inquiry and formal vote process in Senelec for the submission and uh, and the use of the checklist. I think the main differences, and I will focus on the main difference between Senelec and Sen in this case, is that in Senelec, we don't have yet a matrix of responsibilities to show who within the TC is responsible for uh, doing certain tax tasks related to we, with ARM9 standards. So this does not exist, but Senelec uh, members are currently uh, discussing uh, these matrix of responsibilities. So the same process applies. The working group drafts uh, the ARM9 standards. The three documents that I just explained before needs to be submitted to the TC secretary that needs to ensure that everything is fine and submit the ARM9 standard and the checklist to CCMC uh, for formal vote and inquiry procedures. If the checklist is not there, uh, CCMC will reject the ARM9 standard and then the TC secretary needs to ensure that the checklist and the ARM9 standard will be resubmitted again uh, but this time uh, correctly filled. So that was it. Uh, that was it from my side. Thank you very much, and I'm happy again to to answer any question you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Nuno and uh, Terry as well. I suggest that we continue with the following part of the presentation. Uh, can I please ask Constant to sh start sharing the screen because uh, he will be talking about drafting harmonized standards in the international context. So he will uh, specify more uh, about the Vienna and the Frankfurt Agreement. Please Constant, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. There's, can you see my screen indeed, uh, the presentation? Yes, we do. Very well, thank you very much and, and good morning to everybody. Thanks uh, for joining this webinar on my side as well. So my name is Constant, I'm account manager of the Electro Technology Department. So mainly dealing with uh, ENIC parallel standard for LVD, EMC and RED. But here the, the purpose of this session is really to address uh, the development of harmonized standards in the context of the Vienna and the Frankfurt Agreement. And notably when we start the development of parallel standard, because as you know, standard coming from ISO or from IAC can also be candidate for citation in the official journal to, to give presumption of conformity. So you may imagine that uh, since we are addressing a particular international context, there are some specificities that apply uh, in the process, but also in terms of content. And of course, here today, the purpose is not to go into the detail 
of the, the same ISO uh, dimension or the same like IC dimension, but to give you some uh, tips, some advice, uh, on, notably on where to find the, the appropriate information, who to contact, to reach a successful harmonization in, in that context from a horizontal perspective. So starting with the presentation, you may know that uh, I would like to quickly go through uh, some information about the Vienna Agreement. So those people coming from the Sen ISO community know that very well, but I would like to indeed mention that uh, this is an, a formal agreement on the technical cooperation between ISO and Sen, which was signed first in 91, and which uh, main purpose is indeed to avoid the duplication of work at international and European level. So you can see on this diagram that uh, we have a certain level of alignment with ISO in that respect, uh, supporting international standardization uh, where relevant, uh, where it uh, matches the European market need, but also the European legislative needs when it comes to, to harmonize standard. Um, I also would like to quickly go through the, the Frankfurt Agreement, uh, which governs the relation uh, between SENEC and IEC for the development of harmonized standard. So you can see on the diagram that uh, when it comes to Senelec, uh, there's a greater alignment to international standardization in that respect, in the sense that uh, every international uh, standardization project that's starting at IEC level starts also at Senelec level. Um, so it was uh, formalized through the Dresden Agreement in 96 and then uh, by the Frankfurt Agreement in 2016. And indeed, uh, similarly to the to the uh, to the Vienna Agreement, it's about uh, this commitment to international standardization and, and to start the work uh, at international level uh, in order to support uh, the European need. So now I would like to go through a, a bit uh, deeper into the um, development process for harmonized standards under the Vienna and the Frankfurt Agreement. And basically for that aspect, it's very important to note that everything that has been said previously, all those different principles, uh, they apply as well when you're in the, in the Vienna or Frankfurt Agreement context for the development of standards. So the same principle apply indeed, uh, but of course with additional consideration to address the international standardization process, because here we are really in the situation where ISO or IC have the lead for the development of the standard. So it's uh, the ISO or IEC technical committee that have grip on the development of the standard, on the drafting of the standard. So it's very important indeed to ensure a strong communication and coordination between the European technical committee and the international technical committee with of course a specific role for secretaries, convener, but also for the technical project manager in CCMC or in ISO and IEC. And of course, since you are um, addressing the parallel development of standards for the purpose of having them harmonized, it is about ensuring this consensus, not only at European level, but also at international level. And so the outcome of uh, standards that would have been developed in parallel with ISO and IEC, and that eventually will be cited in the official journal is very powerful because the same standard will apply worldwide and it will give presumption of conformity uh, in Europe to specific directives or, or regulation. So this is a very powerful tool, but of course it, it, it provides some additional challenges uh, in that respect, notably to, to coordinate very well uh, between the European community, uh, community and the international community. So as you can see uh, here, you can find again this famous slide about the standard development process. And you know that between SEN, SENEC, and ISO and IEC, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the standardization process is quite similar in the sense that we have formal standardization steps, uh, like the inquiry and the formal vote and their equivalent at international level. So the DIS or CDV or the FDIS, uh, which is the equivalent of the formal vote. And all those stages are, will be performed in, in parallel indeed. So when the standard will reach the European public inquiry, it will reach the, 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 the IEC CDV for, for instance. So here, the, the, very, the same principle apply very much in the sense that we have different steps uh, to involve the, the, the consultant, notably at the first working draft level, which is highly recommended, but also on the need to request assessment uh, with all the necessary um, elements before the start of the inquiry or before the start of the formal vote. So this is something that applies in the, in the international uh, standardization context as well. 
And um, as, a, as it is obvious, uh, when uh, such an international standard reach a compliance assessment, it will be cited in the, in the official journal. But of course, when we place ourselves in the international context, we have some differences, uh, notably related to the, to, the, to the start of a specific project, because if the project starts at ISO and IC, uh, in Europe, we don't have the need to, to, to make available a, a formal new work item request, especially if we deal with Senelec, because if a new work item is created at IEC, it is automatically created in the, in the European Technical Committee work program. And of course, it's all about submitting for the different assessment stages all the relevant uh, elements that are needed by the consultant to perform the assessment. So, of course, the standard uh, as developed uh, at ISO and IEC, but also the specific European element like the Annex Z, Annex Z for Senelec, Annex Z for, uh, for Sen, and all the different uh, elements like the, 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 the table of common that was previously mentioned. So all of that needs to be integrated into a, a single package, which needs to be submitted to the consultant at uh, those different stages. And, and the fact of of uh, creating this appropriate package can be a challenge in itself. So that's why it's all about uh, contacting your technical project manager in CCMC to make sure that all the relevant documents are available to support, uh, hopefully, a compliant assessment. So here, I would like to, to spend a bit more time indeed about the, the, the different interaction uh, within the standard development process and when can an assessment be requested. So as I mentioned, this is the same thing, indeed, we have four different stages during which we can request an assessment. Um, the first working work, which is not mandatory, but highly recommended. And here it's all about getting the, this, the, the appropriate draft from ISO and IC uh, to be sent to CCMC so that we can request an assessment uh, at, at this stage. Then we have the inquiry and the formal vote, which are more formal steps uh, for requesting an assessment and which are mandatory in order to reach a successful um, harmonization. But as I mentioned, and as you can imagine, uh, when you are in the case of ISO or IEC lead, it's the international committee that drafts, uh, develops, and progress the standards. So it's very important that when we request an assessment, you have all these uh, um, different elements, appropriate elements, all together. So the standard, but also the, the specific European element uh, for the standardization um, for the assessment request. And here, uh, with this next slide, I would like to also to address uh, some additional consideration in the case of ISO or IC lead under the Vienna and the Frankfurt Agreement. The first element relates to the fact that the checklist that uh, Nuno presented does not apply in the case of ISO or IC lead, because indeed, as I mentioned, um, the European Technical Committee has no grip as such on the submission of the standard to the standardization procedures. That's why uh, this checking does not apply because it's, it's all about the international committee that is dispatching uh, this draft to the relevant procedures. Um, but of course, the, the use of the checklist is very much recommended because, as it was mentioned, it's not about uh, providing some additional administrative burden, but rather to provide you with some guidance to make sure that you have integrated all the necessary elements uh, in the standard, but also in the additional European element for, for assessment. Um, so, um, and so that's the first consideration. The second one um, still relates, as I mentioned, to the fact that the assessment needs to be requested before the start of the parallel inquiry or before the start of the parallel formal votes. But here again, we have some additional consideration to address. For instance, in the case of parallel ENIC, the standard cannot be modified before the, the formal star, start of the inquiry or, or the formal vote because uh, the IC has the lead, the IC decides on the submission to the standardization process. So, um, so a vote, for instance, cannot be suspended in that case. So it's very important to be as agile as possible to ensure a strong communication with the international uh, TC and notably with the convener of, in charge of drafting the, the international standard so that there is this uh, regular and efficient channel of communication between the, the different officers in the relevant TC to address the comments that were submitted at European level to reach uh, compliance at European level. For parallel EN ISO, this is something that is a bit different in the sense that we have a, 
a bit more grip uh, in the in the in the process because the ISO will not start the vote until the results of the assessment are known, actually. And then, depending on the outcome of the assessment, ISO may decide to start the vote or not on the standard. So, so again, it requires strong communication with the ISO technical committee to, to make sure that ISO can wait for, uh, for, for, for the possibility to address the European consultant comment in the new draft. But as I mentioned, this is not the case for IEC. The IEC will not wait for, for Europe to be ready. They will start the, the standardization procedure. The third point I would like to address, um, and that reflects uh, what was presented about the possibility to resolve a non-compliant assessment of formal vote, is also something for which uh, we have more, um, uh, for which we have a different framework in the case of the Vienna and the Frankfurt Agreement. Because here, as you can imagine, we work in parallel with ISO and IEC. So in the case we receive a, a, a negative uh, assessment of formal vote, it will not be possible for the European TC, for instance, to trigger a second formal vote or to wait for making available a new edition. Because uh, in this case, we will not be working anymore in, in parallel with ISO and IC. And so that's very important that we remain aligned, that there's a the strong communication to raise any concern. But um, as it was also mentioned previously, um, we cannot modify as such the text of the standard, but the European Technical Committee can still work on the European annexes like the Annex ZZ or the Annex ZA. Um, so giving us some room, room to reach uh, compliance if uh, the comments from the consultant are especially targeting those, uh, those different annexes. But if the, there are concerns from the consultant on the text of the standard, uh, it will be a challenge in, it, in itself to remain aligned with ISO and IC in that context. So, so it's important to, to, have a, to be aware of that and to anticipate as much as possible, which means also to request the assessment on the standard as soon as possible in the process so that as soon as we receive the outcome of the assessment, we can take some measures to address uh, the different issues. And here, yeah, uh, with this animation, it's, it's all about uh, the, 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 the approach of being able to, to catch the trend of international standardization to make sure that the European Committee is not lagging behind when we deal with the harmonization of, of the standards. So as I mentioned, anticipation is key uh, when we place ourselves in the international context. I would like also to address what does not change, actually. Uh, first, with the new work item, it's still up to the European Technical Committee to evaluate the possibility to link a specific standardization project with a standardization request work program. And it's true that for st some standardization requests, uh, the European Commission requests the development of specific standards with a clear list of standards to be developed. For some other directive, especially in the EN IEC context, like the LVD, EMC, or RED, we, we, uh, we, we face some open mandate, which means that any standard or any product that is in the scope of the directive or the standardization request can be linked uh, to the standardization request work program. So here it's all about having a strong communication with your technical project manager in systems. The request of the first working draft assessment is also something that does not change and that is highly recommended so that very early in the standardization process, the technical committee can be aware of, uh, of the compliance issues uh, and so that with the future step in the standardization process, the technical committee can address this issue. That's very important for the purpose of flagging uh, compliance issues early in the, in the development process. The exchanges with the HAS consultant uh, must take place as much as possible, of course, as it was previously described. So I will not spend more time on that uh, because this is something that does not change. The preparation of the documentation for the meeting, this is also the same and especially uh, underli underlining the need for uh, making available the HAS assessment report with the TC remark from the previous stage to the next one so that the consultant knows already how the technical committee has addressed the different comments that were submitted at the previous stage. And of course, a no normally a compliant assessment is required for Sensenec to proceed with the, the publication of the European standard and its offering for citation to the European Commission. And then it's a European Commission decision uh, to cite the standard in the official journal uh, as such. 
And then I also would like to, to, to spend a bit more time uh, to conclude my presentation on the, on the, the content of those uh, international standards that are being developed in parallel with, uh, uh, with SEN or SENELEC. And here it's very important to stress the fact that if you have a standard coming from uh, ISO and IEC that is subject to international uh, consensus, but that, that has not reached a compliant assessment at European level, it does not mean that the standard is not good for the market because obviously this standard was subject to international consensus. So obviously it has involved a lot of different expertise. So, so we can uh, legitimately think that this standard is good for the market, but it only means that the standard has not met some specific uh, requirement, compliance requirement for the purpose of being harmonized in Europe. So if you receive a lack of compliance assessment, don't believe that it's because your, your standard is not good enough in terms of quality, in terms of safety, security, or, or any other aspect. It's just that the standard um, has not met some specific requirements, like the ones that you can see on the screen, all about having a concise and clear scope we know that for some international standards that have a long history, this is uh, something that uh, may be a challenge to uh, notably in terms of updating the scope to make it clearer uh, in, in terms of support of specific legislation, for instance. Um, the second point, it's about, it's about those objectively verified requirement and test methods. So here it's about avoiding that the same clause in the standard contains requirements that address different pieces of legislation. For instance, a clause addressing safety aspect, EMC aspect, and radio aspect. It, in that case, it's very likely that uh, because of this specific clause that would provide presumption of conformity, the, the standard will receive a, a lack of compliance assessment. So it's very important always to make a distinction uh, between the requirement and, and, and the, the, the specific topic uh, that they address. Of course, we have the, the topic of the normative references, which was extensively addressed already. So this is something that uh, needs to be addressed by the technical committee. In Senelec, we have the possibility to address this through the Annex A day. Uh, but here again, it's all about creating also a consensus on the Annex A day and, and for which uh, also a strong communication is needed with your technical project manager. The neutrality principle was also addressed uh, and something that is still relevant uh, for international standard developed in parallel with uh, SEN or, or SENELEC. Uh, we have the topic of the Annex ZD and Annex ZZ as well. We, 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 we can face a negative assessment because those annex can be not uh, precise enough, for instance. So it's an important point of attention. And of course, uh, the need to comply with sector specific rules and for which uh, we have uh, specific webinars or tra training that are available on the SENSENEC website. And we are also planning to, uh, by the end of the year, to develop more sector specific uh, training on, uh, for the different legislation to really give you as a technical committee the, the guidance you need in terms of process, but also in terms of content, what you can do, what you cannot do, uh, what are the good tips uh, for the development of, of standards in that respect? So indeed, it's all about reaching compliance on all those different aspects. And that's it on my side. So, so thank you very much. I'm available to, to uh, respond to any question. Don't feel free also to contact me on my email address because it's, it's all about uh, providing, uh, you, providing you with the, with the appropriate support that you need as a technical committee. So thank you very much and uh, looking forward to exchanges uh, more with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Constant. I think a few questions came in regarding what, uh, about uh, what you've been uh, telling us now. Uh, so please uh, have a look. Uh, and then I suggest that we continue with the last part of the presentations that we've foreseen for this morning. Uh, Gonzalo will be sharing his screen and talk about the famous citation of the harmonized standards in the official journal. Please, uh, Gonzalo, the floor is yours. Yeah, so good, uh, good morning, everyone. <laughs> so uh, my name is Gonzalo Sinso. I'm uh, the account manager for Digital Solutions. So we are responsible for the production and the data handling of all the uh, all the European standards. Um, so I will be covering the, the final step. You know, after all the work that has been done, we then offer the standards for citation to official journal, and I will try to give you. Uh, an overview of the process and what happens in different steps. 
So as you have seen uh, in this slide uh, during some of the, of the presentation, so the area that we are going to cover at the moment is essentially the final step. So after the documents have been made available, uh, there is a process that starts uh, a little bit before um, the documents are, are finalized and then they are offered for, for the for citation of the official journal. Uh, and this is the, um, the different elements that I'm going to cover in the different steps. So uh, the process at the moment considers the finalization of the European standards. So when this means, you know, when the documents have the date of availability. And at the moment, we are working with um, different um, uh, batches in a way that are annual on a quarterly basis. So for instance, in the quarter two from April to June, the documents that are finalized at this period, uh, beginning of July, so in, in the coming days, we will be offering these new references for citation. And only after this step, uh, the Commission will, um, will formally start the process of the assessment of these references. Uh, so at the moment, uh, quarterly, we offer the references for citation of the journal. This goes with the formal process. And as I said, this means that you know all the documents finalized between April and June, then they will be offered in the coming month. Um, what actually really happens in this process? So before uh, the quarter finishes, so now we finalized June, so we handled this exercise a few a few weeks ago. So CCMC has identified all the references. So in line with that has been presented up to now, you know, the standard has been linked to legislation, standardization request, and it's one of these legislation that is offered for citation in the official journal. So we identify those projects. Of course, as part of the process, you know, these documents have to have an as assessment, and in principle, it should be a compliant assessment. Of course, at the final step, formal vote, you know, in exceptional cases, we may have an assessment that was not compliant, but the document has been corrected and finalized before the publication. So this is also taken into consideration. When all this is, is, is clear and, and validated, then we offer the references for, um, for citation under the different pieces of legislation. So it's important for you to be aware that each standard even if it's linked to different pieces of legislation, it will be offered for citation under a specific uh, piece of legislation. Uh, important to highlight as well uh, that the, um, we do also a pre-notification of these references for citation. So of course, um, at the end, towards the middle of June, we send a pre-notification with, with the information of which documents are going to be formally offered at the end of the quarter. Uh, just to be clear and to, to, for you to be aware, at this step, we are still in this element, you know, before documents have been formally offered for citation in official journal. And in the table, you can see which are the periods that we are considering in terms of uh, references offered for citation in the official journal. Then we move into the next step. So everything has been uh, validated by CCMC. In some cases, we may need to still to double check uh, with, with technical committees, but very often at this step, everything is already clear and, and the technical PMs will know if the document is good to go or not. So at this moment, we then start the formal process. So there is a letter sent to the European Commission informing which uh, references and pieces of legislation and new references that are offered for citation in the official journal. Uh, at the same time, of course, there is also the data transmission, you know, all the references are provided to the commission system. Uh, and also, uh, of course, all the documents are in principle available for the commission in case they want to, to check and assess the documents. Um, then we get into the, you know, the final step, which is, the action uh, around uh, the assessment and the validation of the references. So this is purely on the commission side. And at the moment, there is this um, internal process in the European Commission because uh, we do our main contact is through DG Grow, which may need to, to contact the different sector units. Uh, and at the moment, there is this time of 10 weeks deadline for them to provide feedback. Uh, and as an outcome of this assessment from the Commission services, uh, there are two main possibilities. One is to accept leading to the citation in the official journal, and this can also come together with a letter 
formally informing us that they are going to site uh, as early as possible. Or on the other hand, if something or some short, shortcomings have been identified with the standards, then we may also need to, to deal with a, with a rejection letter that uh, can come to sign and sign off. So as you, you can understand, this is really the process or the moment where the commission is, is confirming. Of course, the overall as process in place is supposed to support and to uh, accelerate and to uh, feed into this finalization step. And the commission is taking that into account. But of course, as you may be aware, there may be additional uh, circumstances, you know, input from member states providing in specific cases, you know, formal objections that the commission also needs to take into account in this assessment. When all goes well, then of course the standards are cited in, in the official journal. Uh, uh, in the past, the standards used to be published in the, in the C series, which was just a communication. Now they are published in the L series, which are um, considered you know, uh, law. Uh, so there is a link to, to this um, to this citation. Um, and of course, uh, when whenever this is happening, standards and like are informed. And of course, we also inform technical bodies. Uh, when this is happening in also our members. Um, the way that this is done at the moment, of course, it will also vary from sector to sector. So in, for instance, this is an example of, of low voltage. Uh, for those involved in, in, in these sectors, um, the low voltage uh, directive has a, a big list of, of, of references. So for the time being, the commission is only amending uh, or adding the new references. So it is not preparing consolidated lists. On the other hand, there are other cases and other sectors, you know, for instance, toys, the list of, of, of harmonized standards is a little bit shorter, so they are able to, to have uh, consolidated lists. Um, it's also important to highlight that in some cases, the Commission may include notes, uh, you know, including the limitations on the reading of the standard. Uh, and it's also, uh, this can also be in the framework of discussions and the process about the citation of the standard in the official journal. Um, then, of course, the, the very often uh, in the past, the things have been improved in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, the Commission rejected some of the standards for citation. And, and of course, in this case, uh, the, we are not in the ideal situation because the commission confirms that the standards cannot be cited in the official journal, and then we need to come back to, to the technical bodies to, to, to ensure that uh, ad hoc measures are, are, are taken. And most likely, very often, we will have to amend or revise the standard. There could be, in some cases, very exceptional circumstances that you know we are still able to convince the European Commission to cite even without changing the, the standard, but this is very often not, not the case. So with this um, outcome from the European Commission, uh, of course, you know, when the Commission rejects the standards, they provide the reasons. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are specifically detailed. Uh, sometimes they can be very generic. Uh, and the tendency is very often is also that they are rather generic and detailed. But in some sectors, there is a very in-depth assessment and with, with a quite detailed list of, of the reasons why the standard cannot be cited. Uh, at that moment in time, we inform the technical bodies and then uh, you know, any follow-up actions are necessary. Uh, you will have to, to basically get, you know, through the process to revise, to amend. And, and there are several uh, ways and, and, and means to do this and to try to resolve the situation. So basically, this is, this is what I wanted to present from the process from the offering until the citation. Uh, I think it's also important for you to be aware that the, the, the timings uh, are, are vary pretty much from different pieces of legislation. Uh, big sectors will tend to cite, uh, you know, at least twice a year, depending if we have enough references, if they have references that can be cited as well. Small sectors will, you know, most likely not be uh, cited in the official journal more than once uh, every year. So this is something for you to be, to be careful and to take into account. And uh, as you, you have seen, there is a link with the generic information on the Commission website where you can find the status and the new list of citations in the official journal. Else, I think we are back to you again. Yes, thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for these presentations. Um, I think we came to the end of the presentation or the, the webinar. 
uh, a few questions remain unanswered, I see. I don't know if you intend to reply them lively or what are your plans with these questions. Uh, I would like to inform the audience that we do uh, intend to create a Q&A report so that we will uh, have a little file with all the questions and the answers uh, ready for you uh, for downloading. I can go through to some of the, of the questions, uh, Al. So I can start with the first one in, in the list. Yeah, of course, go ahead. So there is a question from Stephen Cornish. Why are citation requests sent quarterly as a batch rather than when they are received by Sun and, and Sun Alike? Well, um, this is for, 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 uh, for a reason, you know, is historical reason, I would say. Uh, this has been um, like this for a couple of years and, and uh, some of the reasons are related also with the availability of the documents, uh, with the, the time necessary to provide them to the commission for the commission to assess. Um, in another way, it was also related with the fact that in the past, um, if the commission was preparing a new list for citation, we were not able to provide new references for citation. Uh, but of course, um, we, we also are uh, working in, in our, together with the European Commission to understand whether we can um, you know, improve the process and, and, and make it in a different way. Uh, anyway, uh, just to be clear as well, you know, it's it's not the, the, the quarterly uh, uploading of reference that is creating a, a rather delay in the citation, uh, because, you know, in some cases, you know, it's a question of a couple of weeks, a maximum one, one month or two that will delay. So this is not, uh, I would say this is not dramatic as long as the process is is well established and it, there is there is time to, to you know to deal with it and to have standard citing the future. Thank you, Gonzalo. So there is another question also from Team Yates about whether the standard is, is available, will be made available even they see refers to cite it. Yes, uh, this is this is what is going to happen. So first of all, and I may, uh, as I may clear, made clear in, in the slides. So when we offer the standard for citation the official journal, the document is already available. Uh, in principle, the document is technically valid. And of course, there may be some challenges around the, the links with the presumption of conformity. And I want to highlight as well, depending the different pieces of legislation, there may be different approaches on how the citation is handled um, and all, what is the impact of not citing the reference in the official journal. Um, but yeah, coming to, to the end, the standard uh, is technically valid. You know, it's been positively voted. The members accepted its technical content. Uh, there may be ad hoc actions to ensure that, uh, you know, the harmonization elements are taken fully into account, but in principle, technically speaking, the standard will not have a, a problem. So there is um, one question related with the process for first working draft, and then I can also take this one on, on board. Um, so it is, the question is, uh, second, so there are a few kind of questions coming in. Um, so it is important that we have a project created. So this is essential. So, um, and of course, if you are, Talking about the project, uh, so the, sorry, I, I, I did read through the question. So it's from Petar Luyasic. Uh, there is a question around whether we can submit a, a working draft or a CD draft for assessment if the project doesn't exist in Sarah. Um, if there is no draft available, what is the assessment to be based on without a draft? So it is clear that we need to have a working draft and we need to have a project because only having a project active, we can ask the first working draft assessment even for a parallel project. So this is the basis for, for, for the starting of the work. There is